It's my pleasure now to introduce Rhonda Stewart, who many of you will know, but for those of you who don't, she's an uh, ID physician and head of infection control at Monash Health. And uh, um, Monash, along with Rhonda and her team at the emergency department there, have really been leaders in uh, identifying some of the issues in emergency departments and hand hygiene, as well as excess IV use and so forth. And with Monash and Royal Melbourne and Austin, we're actually in the process of uh, developing some new initiatives regarding these, one of these problem areas, that is emergency. So exactly as Didier said, you know, if you look at what are the remaining problems we can discuss about benchmarks and all this 80% and whatever, but actually all that's nonsense because we know that there are certain areas which are really problem areas and emergency department and anaesthesia are two key areas we need to focus on and Rhonda's been uh, working on that and that's what we're going to hear about now. Thanks Rhonda. So I'm just going to give a bit of background first and then um, talk about a couple of studies I've been doing with, um, with Lindsay and Andrew. So uh, as you know the emergency department is part of many of our hospitals and um, it's a frequent interface between the public and the patients with communicable diseases, frontline to public health emergencies as we see more and more regularly and the gateway to all the admissions into our hospitals and, and hence all the bacteria as well. And we're having increased presentations and this push to move patients out of our emergency departments puts a lot of stress and strain on the healthcare workers in that environment. And although it's a critical setting for hand hygiene, it's often overlooked. Hand hygiene is often overlooked because of all these other um, things that need to happen in the emergency department. And there probably is a, a subculture of um, infection control not being as important as opposed to the other urgent things that are happening um, in the emergency department at the time. So there are lots of barriers and they focus around the rapid paced high volume workload in the emergency department, the patients themselves, the undifferentiated illnesses that they present with, the delirious IV drug users, combative patients we've all seen in those departments, lots of problems with um, resources that are limited, you know, health um, patients lined up in corridors, we've all seen patients in, in trolleys um, when there's not enough space in the emergency departments. And the other important thing is to the healthcare worker variety. So um, there's much more outsiders coming into the emergency department. So like we saw with the um, walking around of the healthcare workers and medical um, staff around different wards, all these healthcare workers are coming into the department. There's less ownership of who owns the hand hygiene compliance in that area. And there's also a thought that there's actually more medical interactions in the emergency department than anywhere else in the hospital. And we know that's bad because we know medical um, staff aren't doing performing hand hygiene well. Um, now, in the literature, hand hygiene rates vary from lows of 10% up to highs of 90%. And the variations are attributable to, I guess, different ways of auditing. So we can't really compare auditing in, in Canada to auditing in, in Australia if we're using different moments and also different auditors. But also the, the issues of lack of time, the urgent clinical situations, the high um, workload, as I've already stated. And there's very little literature on how we can improve compliance in the emergency department. It's mainly sort of quasi-experimental studies. So I just wanted to um, show you a couple of papers that have been looking into um, hand, hard, hand hygiene compliance in emergency setting. This paper was done in Canada over a 40 month period and what they found compliance there, interestingly in a lot of the papers I'm presenting that um, medical compliance is actually higher than nursing compliance in the emergency department. I'm not really sure why but those papers certainly have highlighted that. But the overall compliance in this study was 29%. Um, but one of the big factors uh, of compliance was the busyness in the emergency department and, and they used this here, they used a marker of time to being seen by a physician as, as one of the um, markers of um, busyness and certainly if the um, ED was busier then the compliance decreased. Another study, again, looking over many, many moments, over a number of months, did a univariate analysis and looked at the shift, including um, whether it was in day or night shift, um, whether the patient was located in, a, um, in the corridor, in, uh, in the private part of the emergency department, um, the healthcare worker group, uh, whether gloves were used or weren't used. 
And again, um, here they use a seven point scale of emergency crowding, which looked at time to position um, assessment and also um, how many patients were there compared to how many bays were in the um, emergency department. And in the multivarial analysis, really the things that came out were um, the shift of the day, you're more inclined to have better hand hygiene at night time rather than during the day. Um, if patients were placed in the hallway, then compliance decreased. If you were a physician, actually, interestingly, again, the hand hygiene was better than in the nursing staff. And again, this crowding factor seemed to be very important um, as a marker of decreasing hand hygiene <coughs> compliance. Another fact which has been brought up a couple of times today is whether actually if you actually got more medical interactions and more moments, is that actually why the compliance in emergency departments is so low, if we're actually seeing more me medical staff in, in the emergency department? So this paper just looked at the overall mean interactions um, for medical staff and overall staff in surgical, medical, intensive care and emergency departments. And you can see that overall there's more interactions um, in the emergency departments than surgical and medical wards but not as many as in ICU. But when you just looked at physician interactions, there's more physician interactions than any other part of the hospital. And again, um, with hand hygiene opportunities, again, um, there is more physician hand hygiene opportunities than any other healthcare worker group in the emergency department. So it just made people think, well, maybe it's because of um, the medical compliance is low, so that's why emergency department compliance is low. Um, and again, this again is looking at a physician scores here. And I really find this one hard to believe, but they had a um, um, physician compliance of 91% in this emergency department, which is pretty outstanding. Um, again, poor compliance um, if you're an ambulance staff member, which is certainly something we see. If patients were parked in the hallway, decreased your compliance. And um, if glove use was, was there as well. So the published interventions, um, you know, we all know the different interventions. We can have high visibility signs, we can um, give them hand sanitizers, have pocket portable hand sanitizers, education programs, um, and you know, workflow organisation. All have been attempted, but we're not really getting very high rates of hand hygiene compliance. This latest paper, very late paper, um, just published this year. Um, looked at hand hygiene appliance across um, in the emergency department in nurses, physicians um, in particular. And they did a multimodal approach with education, posters, um, also plating people's hands and showing them um, how badly they were doing. Um, and they did increase their compliance overall from around about 20% up to around about 50%. And in the final intervention, in, in the dark there, they actually um, tried to look at social behaviour where they implanted people with poor um, uniforms and long nails and um, lots of jewellery on and see, tried to see if people actually would stand up to them and, and tell them that they were doing the wrong thing. And interestingly, um, out of many observations, only two times were somebody um, pulled apart and saying, you know, you actually didn't clean your hands <coughs> or you, you've got long nails that shouldn't be there. So that's uh, something to think about. Um, maybe that's something we need to think about in our emergency departments. So there was no difference in the time of the day, the type of patient or the nurse-patient ratio. Um, and interestingly, in this study too, they used student auditors, um, which none of the emergency department knew. So they really thought that there was no Hawthorne effect in their auditing here. And finally, another recent paper looking at curtains, and we know that curtains in the emergency department are a real problem because there's curtains between every patient, between every cubicle, and we're always going in and closing up and closing up the um, curtains. And this paper just looked at the bacterial counts on healthcare workers' hands. So at baseline, they had pretty poor, um, they had lots of bacteria at baseline, suggesting that they're not really performing hand hygiene anyway. Um, then after hand hygiene, the counts decreased by about 50%, but still not great. So the actual way they were using the hand hygiene wasn't great. And then after they handled the curtains, there was a 50% increase in bacterial counts on their hands, suggesting that you know, this is another area for intervention. 
So we've been talking about um, where we can go to with, with hand hygiene emergency departments, with Hand Hygiene Australia. And um, Lindsay and Andrew and I got together with also Carolyn from the Royal Melbourne and we decided we should first of all investigate whether this doctor-patient um, interaction, whether the number of moments that we're seeing medical staff perform in the emergency department really did make a difference um, to the overall compliance. So we first started looking at compliance um, in all the data from Hand Hygiene Australia in one audit period and did a multiple risk logistic regression on that. And what we found to begin with is we looked at 152 hospitals with th over 360,000 moments. Um, and 108 of those hospitals were actually submitting <coughs> emergency department data. The overall compliance in emergency department was 75% and it was significantly lower than um, the acute wards and the high risk wards. Um, and again, the proportion of medical interactions um, and the moments that medical staff are actually interacting with patients was, was significantly higher at 23% compared to 15% and 14% <coughs> on the acute and high risk wards. And again, the medical compliance was lower, as we know, um, in the emergency department, um, as opposed to the acute and high risk wards. But despite that, um, after adjusting for profession and hand hygiene indications, this compliance is still significantly lower in the emergency department than, than other um, acute wards in the hospital. So it really suggests that there are other factors involved in, um, in uh, emergency department hand hygiene compliance. So we wanted to look further into this data. And so what we did next was we wanted to look at the modifiable determinants of hand hygiene compliance in the emergency department and specifically look at more environmental factors such as whether, anti whether alcohol based tab was at the point of care, um, where the patient was, um, what the workload and busyness was of the emergency department and other um, patient factors. So we looked at five sites, three from Monash, one at the Austin and one at the Royal Melbourne, and we collected the basic information that we do with all the hand hygiene and auditing, um, plus, some in, plus some added factors that we were hoping to find some um, extra information from the emergency department. So the basic information we looked at whether the alcohol-based hand rub was at the point of care, whether there's actually education of healthcare workers um, in the emergency department, whether there's audit and performance feedback, whether there were reminders in the workplace, and also trying to gain an idea if there's any safety culture in the emergency department. And then the enhanced data we, we looked at was we tried to look at the ED type, so whether it was a paediatric or, or an adult emergency area. Um, the additional things we looked at as well in the moment level data were bed and cubicle numbers, where the patient was located, whether there was hand rub available, the, tri the triage category, the age category, whether the patient was cooperative. Um, we did look at sex as well of the healthcare worker and whether the ED staff member actually mm. belonged to the emergency department or were from outside the emergency department. And we also looked at busyness, but we looked at that as the number of people in the emergency department as opposed to the number of actually designated beds that were available in the emergency department. So as I said, five campuses, we had 24 auditors, uh, nearly 100 observation sessions and 1,800 hand hygiene moments. And I'll just go through the, the univariate analysis just to give you an idea of, of what we are looking at. So the campus really showed that hand hygiene is not great um, from around about 50%, um, one of the sites was getting a rate around about 75%. Time of day, uh, the, the day of the week didn't really matter too much. The shift you can see here, um, maybe afternoon shift has um, more compliance in the afternoon. Um, location, so you can see that uh, triage, even though the numbers are really small, um, uh, we need to get some more numbers, but triage doesn't seem to have very good hand hygiene. And interestingly, the, in the resource area, hand hygiene tend to be, to be better than um, in the main part of the emergency department, which was surprising. And it, maybe it's more that, uh, maybe there's more body fluids, maybe people are more worried about their um, protecting themselves. I don't know, these are the sort of things we need to look into further. Um, alcohol rub point of care, if it was available, of course, people were going to perform hand hygiene better. Triage category didn't really come out too much in this. And the age, again, the numbers are small, 
But the neonate, um, if, if the patient was a neonate, hand hygiene compliance was much higher. And certainly we see in our own neonatal intensive care area, hand hygiene rates above 90% most of the time. So maybe it's a factor of, you know, this is a really precious little thing in front of me and I'm performing hand hygiene, whether it's subconscious or not. But we need to look into that a bit more data. And this also is surprisingly, this is, I expected the opposite to this, but if the patient was non-cooperative, um, hand hygiene was better. So I'm not sure we need to really tease out this a bit more. Maybe it was the, the fact that the patient who's uncooperative is, looks a bit more, I don't know, looks a bit more dirty, protecting ourselves again. We need to think about why that's happening. And profession, no surprise, I mean, ambulance officers are almost zero. <laughs> Um, medical professions, uh, you know, 50, 45 to 50%. Um, and the uh, allied healthcare worker and personal care staff were, were less than the medical staff here. And again, another really important area, the home location. So if you were not part of the emergency department staff, you did, your compliance was much lower, which is certainly an area we need to look at. So on the multivariable model, um, what came out really afternoon shift, Hand hygiene compliance was better, um, and everybody except nursing staff did worse in hand hygiene compliance. Um, and, and you know the, this focus again on um, ownership and non-AD staff and agency emergency department staff doing far worse in their hand hygiene compliance than healthcare workers who actually were a part of the emergency department themselves. And this effect of crowding, interestingly, also came out in. in um, our study, the more crowded the emergency department was, the less um, hand hygiene compliance um, occurred. So moving forward, um, well, we're proving that hand hygiene compliance in emergency department is a problem and that there is lots of things we can do here. Certainly the compliance is lower than in other acute areas and again, doctors have lower compliance, but they also have more opportunities, but even so, their compliance is still lower than um, in the emergency department than in the rest of the, the hospital departments. Um, and we can't explain it just by the healthcare worker profession. There's lots of other things in the emergency department that may be affecting this, such as the busyness of the emergency department, with the ownership um, in the emergency department. So it's a unique setting with a distinct environment, and we certainly need to start thinking about how we can actually change our, our ways of thinking about um, improving hand hygiene compliance in the emergency department. Ensuring availability of alcohol-based hand rub at the point of care is maybe not the only thing we need to do here. We need to start thinking of more important things, and I've mentioned the ownership, um, the busyness, trying to make people understand that, you know, um, the patient in your emergency department now may actually be getting an infection in, in three days' time. And I think we'd, there is that disconnect between emergency staff people understanding what actually happens when, they, when those patients go out to the wards. And the social norms and speaking up in the emergency department is certainly another area of to target. So um, I'll stop there and I just wanted to acknowledge Andrew's work on getting all the statistics done on this study and Lindsay and the Hand Hygiene Australia and Jenny for helping coordinate the program and also Carolyn at the Royal Melbourne and the teams at all the um, emergency departments we looked at. Thank you.